Heads of state and government gather for the 37th summit of the African Union in Ethiopia's capital Addis Ababa this week. The continental body also marks its 22nd anniversary this year. But it is quite a mixed bag of outcomes looking back. On the one hand, peace and security remain of critical concern. On the other, some strides have been made towards more continent-wide integration. So just where is the African Union struggling? And in which areas does it deserve a praise? We discuss all of this in the program this week. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Let's now bring in our panel of experts. With me in studio, Professor Francis Onditi, Associate Professor of Conflictology, Riara University here in Kenya. In Abuja, David Otto Endele, Director, Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies. And in Johannesburg, Dr. Cesar Nkala, Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Center for Africa-China Studies. Gentlemen, a very well, warm welcome to you all and thank you for being a part of this discussion. I want to start off with getting a perspective from all of you very briefly. And David, let me start off with you. The African Union has been in operation for 20 years now. Briefly, what are your thoughts on the performance of of the African Union in the past years? Well, I think the African Union would have to look itself at the mirror. And, you know, uh, and I think when they do that, uh, the realization will kick in uh, that um, you know, the, the, the African continent is not united, you know, as, uh, as the case you know, should actually be, um, uh, in the sense that uh, you know, the country is divided uh, along regional blocks. You know, now you have uh, uh, about six, um, you know, regional blocks uh, that, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, exist in the continent. But, you know, from a security point of view, I think, you know, uh, we've got uh, a lot of conflict going on in the continent, um, a, a lot of uh, wars uh, against, um, you know, governments by jihadist states. We, we're also having uh, a lot of uh, coup d'etats, you know, that are happening, uh, especially in the western part of the uh, the, the continent. So uh, I think from a security point of view, mm -hmm. um, the African Union would have to uh, look back uh, and, and rethink in, in terms of its 20 years existence, especially uh, when he talked about the silencing of the guns, you know, as uh, an agenda 2020 to 2063. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, principally, uh, the, the, the Union has a, a lot to do, uh, not just from uh, that point of view, but more, more so from a point of view of how it can cop down uh, on, on the level of insecurity uh, and the level of chaos, uh, you know, constitutional uh, chaos that exists within the continent. Dr. Nkala, uh, the AU needs serious reflection. Is that your thought as well? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Professor David. I, I think uh, from a security point of view, uh, the African Union has uh, somewhat enjoyed limited success in, uh, in tackling the security crisis uh, affecting the continent, I mean, in countries like uh, Sudan, Mozambique, uh, the Central African Republic and most recently the DRC, uh, where, where conflict uh, and chaos are the order of the day. Uh, and the AU appears to have uh, sort of run out of solutions. But uh, for me, I think the past 20 years of the AU has been, has been mixed. Uh, it has enjoyed some successes, uh, especially in terms of setting the agenda for the continent and raising uh, the right issues and making the right priorities. Uh, for instance, you take, for instance, uh, the AU Agenda uh, 2063 uh, and also uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area uh, that was negotiated and passed uh, mm -hmm. under the aegis of the AU. I think those are important uh, mechanisms and initiatives and the AU should be given credit to it. Uh, what, 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 what limitations the AU has, I think uh, it, 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 they, they go down to uh, uh, to, to, to the member states themselves who formed the AU. There are structural limitations uh, around the AU because uh, it's, 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 a, it's an intergovernmental body. It's not a supranational body. Uh, so what it can do is, is limited by, uh, by those structural uh, limitations, I think. Professor Onditi, your thoughts on this, whether it has had mixed successes or it needs serious reflections, because the Organization of African Unity, which was founded in 1963, was a symbol of liberation uh, for the people. 
fast forward to the African Union, and you were supposed to advance the continent's um, agenda. Has the African Union achieved that agenda? I think uh, one of the things we need to look at is uh, the trajectory that the African Union has made, as my one of your guests said, uh, you know, Agenda 2063. But in between, uh, we shall agree that the African peace and security architecture, you know, the institution within which the African peace and security is conducted, you know, the six uh, structures that have been established uh, since uh, um, in the last 20 years, I think it's something that uh, we need to appreciate. And if African Union as an institution, but also the member state, uh, would want to revolve around that, I think it is uh, something we need to appreciate. However, there are areas that, uh, perhaps uh, gray areas that needs to be uh, reworked, I including uh, self-reliance, uh, you know, as it were, from the pan-African uh, ideas that were established uh, back in 1963 or in 1960s, but also I in early 2000 when um, you know, the protocol, Peace and Security Council protocol was being established. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, on one hand, we can say that uh, African Union is on its journey tightened towards 2063, but also on the other hand, we could say that uh, there is a long way to go in terms of uh, realizing the pan-African uh, idea or agenda that as it were from the beginning. Dr. Nkala, you raised an interesting point on the structural uh, limitations of the African Union because some critics argue that the African Union is an organization that primarily represents the interests of African leaders, while others also argue that the AU is unfairly judged against impossible goals. Remember, those were the goals that it set itself. So what are your thoughts on that perception? African leaders would have to take the 22 years that uh, the African Union has been ex in existence and uh, re reflect on them uh, because the, the principles really that guide the AU are, 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 are the root cause of, its, uh, of it being ineffective. I think the principle of sovereignty uh, where uh, member states are prioritized uh, uh, rather than the AU itself. Uh, member states make the decisions and the AU uh, AU's independence or autonomy mm -hmm. uh, is, is, uh, is really in question. So it, it, it affects its ability to act uh, in, in situations, especially uh, in, in security crisis uh, or maybe in, 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 the date, uh, in the debt crisis that uh, the continent is facing right now. So I, I think as much as the AU was, I mean, our organization of African unity was reformed, uh, leading to the creation mm -hmm. uh, of, of the AU in 2002. I think we need a new structure in Africa uh, to, to improve what the AU is uh, right now. David, uh, your thoughts? Well, well, I think, you know, the, in terms of structure, uh, the, the African Union is well structured. You know, it's got uh, uh, the, uh, what you call the APSA, which is the African Peace and Security Architecture, mm -hmm. uh, which includes the Peace and Security Council uh, that was established in 2002 and uh, you know, unfolded, uh, became officially operational in 2004. I think the, the structure is not a problem. If you, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the Peace and Security Council and the AFSA with the, its five pillars, you have the early warning center, you have the panel of the wise, uh, you have the, uh, the, the, peace, uh, the peace phone, uh, the African network for women and uh, mediation, uh, and the African standby force. So all these elements, uh, from a security point of view, they are already there. All these structures are already there. Uh, I do agree with my colleague that, you know, one of the Achilles heels uh, of the African Union is the fact that uh, it does prioritize uh, the sovereignty of uh, member states. So effectively, uh, the African Union is a, sub, is a subset or a sum of its members. Uh, but I think that's where the, you know, uh, some of the, the tragedy of the African Union's uh, travel, uh, that's where it kicks off. But not only that, uh, as we've observed uh, in, in many crises in the Sahel with the coup d'etats and ECOWAS making decisions, uh, we've also come to the conclusion that the African Union does give priority to regional bodies uh, to deal with uh, issues that arise within its region. Uh, that effectively uh, means that you know, the African Union comes as the last resort in terms of intervention. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the key issues that uh, the African Union is facing. It talks about silencing of the guns, as right. I earlier on mentioned. Um, but of course, you know, how do you achieve that uh, if you know, there is um, the doctrine of uh, uh, sovereign, uh, sovereignty given to member states, mm -hmm. uh, who of course you know, um, you know, are, are kind of you know, keeping the African Union under check instead of the other way around. Uh, 
So I think the African Union is rather concerned um, that if it does not, you know, uh, respect the sovereignty of member states, then what may happen is that, you know, members would begin to leave the African Union, just as we've seen uh, three countries uh, leaving ECOWAS, you know, as a result of them accusing ECOWAS of all sorts of uh, uh, infringements. Um, we've seen the same, like the United Kingdom left the European Union. So I think the African Union is rather uh, worried about, you know, uh, prioritizing the sovereignty of member states. At the same time, right. um, that impedes it, you know, from carrying out its functions effectively. So, Professor uh, uh, Onditi, I want to bring you in here uh, on that whole question of um, the regional bodies and the African Union now looking like a, a body of last resort. We have seen what's happened in the East African community with the DRC. You know, we also saw what, what has happened with ECOWAS, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso and Mali. And we're also seeing what is happening with IGAD in, in, in relation to Sudan. So where does this leave the African Union if it is an organization of last resort. What has remained within the, East, uh, within the African Union is operationalization of the structures that uh, have been established. Um, uh, be because uh, the architecture is clearly designed and it has been tested over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the challenge would be, for example, when we have a challenge in one of the member states or, or, or in the neighborhood, uh, how fast are we able to trigger, for example, the African standby force mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to have the soldiers to, for short-term you know, interventions or the military interventions? Mm -hmm. We've seen that experimented in Sudan, in South Sudan. We've seen that it's experimented in, uh, in DRC. But the repercussions have not been, or the outcome has not been very, very, very pleasant. That means there is something that we are not doing correctly. Now, if you ask me, what is the, you know, the cure? Uh, for, for all this. I, I think uh, one of the things that um, uh, need to be done is uh, uh, perhaps uh, trying to, uh, you know, uh, decentralize or try to uh, give more powers to the regional, um, uh, you know, economic communities mm -hmm. that as it were from the beginning so that uh, uh, instead of, uh, you know, waiting for the decision to come from Addis Ababa, uh, we, we, need, uh, we need that uh, kind of uh, rapid uh, intervention from the, uh, the regional bodies. But, the bu but building trust, mm -hmm. you know, within member states, but also uh, uh, regional blocks is something that is uh, very important. Uh, you saw I, DRC joining East African community, but when it comes to having an intervention in Eastern DRC, they decided to send away the East African uh, you know, uh, standby force right. and, and, and uh, looked for SADC. That means that uh, there is something more than the, uh, the structural problem, which is trust, right. but also uh, how uh, business is supposed to be transacted either within the regional economic communities or at the AU level. So, so Dr. Nkala, let's pursue this a little bit because I want to understand the African Union structure in relation with the African Union Commission. Is there a separation of roles between the political and the executive? Are there conflicting interests here? Well, I think, yeah, the, there is a separation of, of roles there because, I mean, uh, po political leaders have got their own interests and the executive uh, may have its, its own uh, interests. But ultimately, uh, the political leaders' decisions uh, through the African uh, Union Assembly uh, carry weight. Uh, they, 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 they have the final say uh, as to what the African, uh, African Union does. Uh, but I, I think uh, another major problem uh, that faces the African Union uh, is also its funding. Uh, it, it's a body that is uh, deprived of, of sufficient funds to uh, carry out its mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the states have been uh, suspended uh, by the AU itself because they don't pay their dues. Uh, so this has led to the, uh, uh, to the AU being dependent on external, uh, on external funding from, uh, from the European Union, from China, from, uh, from the US, uh, which, is, uh, which is not a good thing uh, because uh, I, I think it has implications on, uh, on the independence of, uh, of, of, of the African Union. But at the same time, uh, maybe to be cynical, I think the, the, the states, the African member states themselves, uh, wouldn't want a very strong uh, mm -hmm. African Union. Uh, it, it's, it's not in their interest because, I mean, these are states that are so in love with their sovereignty and uh, would like to do as they please in the territories that they govern. Uh, and they would like to keep the status quo that way uh, instead of having uh, 
a, a strong supranational continental body uh, that can intervene in their uh, in their countries, uh, they they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't like that. So uh, I, I don't know what uh, what must happen now because we depend on uh, on state leaders, on the political leaders, uh, to make decisions towards uh, reforming uh, the, the AU uh, in, into into a more effective, uh, a more stronger, uh, a more stronger board. And uh, this might not be in their interest. So there's a conflict there. Uh, David, I want to hear your thoughts on that conflict of interest. Is there a conflict of interest between the AUC and, uh, the, and the leadership of the African Union, the president, so to speak? And, and which issues would you say the African Union has acted decisively on? And which ones would you say they could have done better? They fell short. Well, I think, you know, there is a conflict of interest. Uh, and, and Beatrice, you've got to just look at the... Uh, the method by which uh, members are appointed, uh, you know, to represent countries, you know, the, you know, these are appointments, uh, political appointments, and therefore uh, these appointments are a reflection of the government of the day and that government's policy. Uh, in, in, in other words, you know, the people who are at the African Union to make decisions uh, for the uh, peace and security and stability of the continent uh, are making decisions for the peace uh, of well, for the interest of their governments that appoint them. So I think the first thing that the African Union has to change, um, and I'm not really sure uh, that you know it's much of a financial um, issue that you know they don't have sufficient funding. Uh, there will never be sufficient funding, you know, for any organisation. You know, uh, there is always need for more money. But I think you know the the biggest crisis that the African Union face is the same crisis that the UN, uh, the European Union and other uh, you know, bodies mm -hmm. of the same nature they do experience. It is the fact that those who are appointed in those positions of decision making for uh, the benefit of the continent are not representing the continent, uh, they are simply representing their member states. Um, so while you would see uh, again that the African Union has done well uh, in, in scenarios like uh, deploying their peacekeeping forces in the likes of Darfur. Right. Um, we've seen the AU being deployed uh, um, in, in the cases of uh, Somalia as well. Uh, they're still there. Um, but effectively, uh, the, the AU uh, prefers, uh, because of this issue of right. uh, uh, you know, the doctrine of uh, sovereignty, they prefer to leave things in the hands of regional bodies. And when you go down to the regional bodies, Beatrice, it, it is still the same c scenario. Uh, these regional bodies are still represented by the interests of their individual member states. You know, so I, I think you, know, you just have to do a reverse engineering, if, if we want to get this right, uh, that uh, members of the African Union who are decision makers you right. Know, right at the top uh, should not be appointed uh, or um, recommended uh, by their member states. You know, they, they should be independently sourced. Um, and, you know, they, they, they should uh, be representing the interest uh, of the continent, not the interest of their members. All right, gentlemen, on that note, we are going to take a short break. And when we come back, we will look at how the African Union must reform itself to better shape the future of the continent. To stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's now continue with our discussion. Uh, still with me are Professor Francis Onditi, David Otto Endele, and Dr. Ciso Nkala. Uh, Dr. Nkala, the African Union has treaties uh, to promote peace, democracy, and good governance. It is not short of that. But when you look at some other treaties, and as an example like the African uh, Court of Human and People's Rights, that was established to protect human rights and reduce impunity at the national level. Only about 32 countries have ratified um, you know, uh, that protocol. Is there a collective political will in enforcing any of these treaties that the African Union seems to be passing? 
Well, I, I think you are raising an important point. Uh, in, our, in our book uh, on regional African integration, uh, one finding we, we made was that uh, the African Union, since its existence, uh, it has passed, I think, 40 treaties, uh, but only 12 of these treaties have been ratified by the member states and enforced. Uh, so the majority of the treaties are agreed uh, on uh, at the AU assembly uh, level, uh, and then they are taken to nation states where uh, ratification uh, has been very slow, uh, and then only a few treaties are, 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 are ratified. So without ratification, the treaties cannot, uh, cannot be enforced. So this, this really, uh, I think, it, it, it sort of uh, derails uh, the African uh, Union agenda uh, because the treaties uh, tackle important issues. Uh, so without ratification, there's nothing uh, the, the African Union can do. Uh, so I think uh, going forward, uh, countries, uh, member states of the African Union should think about reform, at least uh, give some, some, some uh, as Professor Francis mentioned, maybe make it a supranational body, uh, give it powers to enforce and uh, implement uh, these treaties. Uh, because uh, if, if you wait for member states to, to implement such treaties, they might not have the political will or the interest uh, to implement these uh, treaties. Uh, so they end up, uh, they, 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 they end up being, uh, I mean, uh, ineffective and uh, a damp squib uh, to, 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 to say so. So David, you know, the African Union seems not to be short of treaties and protocols. Uh, kind of fall short on the implementation um, and ratification aspect there. But what would you say are the differences uh, between, let's say, the African Union and other organizations like the European Union? Are there lessons that could be learned and examples that could be borrowed to make the African Union more effective? Well, of course, I mean, there's always an encouragement that uh, if you have a similar uh, body like the EU, uh, then, of course, the African Union has to uh, be able to have some exchanges, you know. Uh, so, for example, let's talk about the, uh, the common movement uh, within the African continent. Uh, that is something which the African Union has to stand very firm and ensure that it is not just individual member states declaring uh, that, you know, uh, there is a common movement within its borders within the African continent, but that there should be a decision uh, that, you know, the African Union should make uh, for and on, the be on behalf of all its member states and in agreement for, for such. Um, this is one area of lessons, you know, the, the free trade, you know, which exists within the European Union. But another key area, uh, Beatrice, uh, is, is the fact that, uh, take for example, uh, the several African, uh, uh, China, African, uh, US, African, uh, uh, Germany or Britain or uh, summits that are happening. Now, these are very brilliant. Um, you know, uh, uh, events. But I think what should happen is that instead of the continent, you know, going to a country, these countries, you know, should come to the continent. It will benefit uh, the African continent more uh, to have a situation where, um, you know, uh, a, a one country visits a continent of 54 uh, rather than 54 countries going to visit one country. So mm -hmm. uh, these are also common areas. Talking about the, uh, the area of currency, you know, we still do not have uh, one currency within the continent. We're still struggling uh, to have regional currencies, right. you know, here, there, and here. Uh, you know, um, and, and that is also an area which I believe uh, that the African Union should learn uh, or should copy from uh, the likes of the, um, the, um, the, the, the European Union. Uh, common security areas, again, you know, we've talked about this. We need to have an African Union uh, that has a Peace and Security Council, that have the APSA, which, you know, uh, talks about the prevention, management, uh, and resolution of, uh, of crisis. We need to have a common framework. Well, let me come to you, Dr. Ankala. The African Union's vision is creating an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa that is driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. Can you identify for us the specific areas where the African Union may need to reassess its strategies to achieve this vision? I think uh, first and foremost, uh, it, it should be the structure of, 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 of African Union uh, in terms of uh, the distribution of power uh, from uh, between the executive and the and the political leaders as well. Uh, it, is, it is important to, uh, to give the executive, uh, the African Union Commission, uh, some powers to implement uh, the decisions of the African Union. 
uh, also to look at uh, institutions such as uh, the, the Peace and Security Council uh, and the Pan-African Parliament. Uh, I, I think uh, most important, um, importantly the Pan-African Parliament mm -hmm. uh, because the Pan-African Parliament, as much as it is uh, a legislative organ uh, of the AU, uh, it doesn't have legislative powers. It cannot, uh, it cannot make laws. It's uh, simply a consultative and advisory body. Uh, so in its current state, it's, it's ineffective. It's not uh, a true representation uh, of the voice of, uh, of, of the grassroots uh, or the masses in Africa. Uh, so, so there is need to look at that, to, to make it uh, a real parliament with uh, effective uh, representational oversight uh, and budgetary powers uh, over, the, over the AU. Uh, we also need to look at funding. Uh, funding is important. Uh, it, 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 it must come from African sources. I mean, uh, we have been talking about African solutions uh, to, to African problems. Uh, so we, we can't be talking about that when, you can't, uh, when we cannot fund our own uh, 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 continental body. Uh, so uh, we need to make sure that the AU is, uh, is, is funded adequately and independently as well uh, to, to, to prevent the possibility of it being influenced by uh, external, uh, external forces. Right. Uh, Professor Onditi, as you uh, wind up uh, the program, what would you say that the African Union needs to focus on in 2024? There is this idea that, uh, you know, you pump, uh, you know, you build agriculture and then the agriculture builds into, uh, you know, industrial hubs. But uh, for, for the last uh, 50 or 60 years, that hasn't worked, you know, in terms of development model. Now, uh, what if Africa would rethink in terms of building infrastructure, which mm -hmm. is something for the last five, ten years, some countries in Africa have been focusing on that and I think they've been doing well. I mean, Kenya... Tanzania, South Africa, uh, to some extent Ghana, uh, they, they've been putting quite a bit of investment with the help of, 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 of a development partners like China. And, and, and if you were to put that on the, on the barometer, I mean, uh, Africa has been going up in terms of uh, infrastructure. So if, if, if we can refocus the development approach into infrastructure, I think 2024 would be a turning point. Um, you know, into focusing the African development agenda and the African peace and security architecture so that it is, uh, uh, you know, internal, internally instigated as opposed to externally, uh, uh, you know, uh, triggered. And I think with that, uh, ownership uh, of the African development would be uh, uh, sure. David, you have the final word. Uh, well, well, I uh, well, I think, you know, the first thing that has to be done is, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the African Union has to change its recruitment strategy in terms of how it onboards uh, its personnel. Uh, the, the structures are already there. Uh, they do exist. What is missing, the big thing that is missing within the African Union is the fact that those who represent the African Union are not representing uh, the, the continent. They are representing their member states. So onboarding process has to change in order for us to achieve anything. And I think secondly, um, the African Union has to see itself uh, as it was established, you know, for, to represent the continent. So when we talk about uh, free continental trade, uh, this has to be implemented from an African Union perspective. When we talk about, uh, you know, free movement, uh, when we talk about a, an African Union standby force that can and mm -hmm. should be able to be deployed. Um, all this needs to exist within the African Union structure. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for that lively discussion on the African Union. But that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to all our guests, Professor Francis Onditi, Associate Professor of Conflictology at the Riara University here in Nairobi. David Otto Endele, Director at Geneva Center for Africa Security and Strategic Studies. And Dr. Sizo Nkala, Postdoctoral Research Fellow at the Center for Africa China Studies. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter. And you can watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. Do join us again next week for more at Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, goodbye.